Welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 20. My name is Jay Oza, and I'm the host of this uh, program. And uh, today uh, we have uh, Julie Finkelstein also joining us. And uh, I'm based out of uh, Hazlitt, uh, New Jersey, which is about uh, 50 miles uh, from New York City. And what we try to do on this show is uh, it's very loosely run. We basically have conversation. And today, having conversation is not as easy as it sounds. And what we do is rather than just have a conversation that doesn't go anywhere, we try to create some structure around it. And what we do is uh, we'll do a quick intro in the beginning. Then uh, we will uh, engage, do a three-minute speech, which could be on any topic. And then we go into particular segments. And we usually have three segments. Uh, today, the first segment is going to be on uh, it's a discussion we, I just wanted to have with uh, uh, people that are joining us, and in this case, Julie, on what is the modern speech today? You know, when we look at speech, if you take a speech course, they'll always talk about uh, the Aristotle definition of speech, attributes of a speech, which is ethos, pathos, and logos. But I think today we need to look beyond that because, uh, because of the technology and other uh, uh, factors. So we'll talk about, we'll have a discussion around that. Uh, second one is uh, a, a very famous speech. Uh, this one is Ronald Reagan's 1984 speech on June uh, 6th, uh, 1984, at uh, one of the favorite, one of the most uh, bloodiest battle that ever took place during the D-Day invasion at Pointe du Hoc uh, near in France. And this is a big speech. And I wanted to include this speech because we talk, we look at a lot of speeches. But we don't look at a lot of the big speeches, historical speeches, that have real ramification as far as the future is concerned. And this took place in 1984, and now we're in 2015. So there's a lot of time that has gone uh, on from 1984 to 2015. So we'll look at it and see how well the speech was constructed and some of the things that he does in the speech, which was really fascinating. It's one of those speeches where you don't see a lot of uh, body movement. It's strictly, it's a very logically organized speech. So that's what I wanted to talk about and have a discussion around that. And the third one is a very interesting speech. It's uh, one that was given by Stephen Levitt. Uh, these are the guys. Uh, there's a uh, two guy, uh, authors, Stephen Levitt and Steve Dubner. They're the fa they're, fa uh, they're famous for their Freakonomics uh, podcast and books that they've written. Uh, and Stephen Levitt is one of the co-authors of that. And here he talks about uh, the research, describes the uh, talk, uh, re talks about the research that they did uh, that uh, for, from the gangs uh, research uh, studying the, this particular gang in Chicago and what he learned from it and how it relates to economics. So I think we have a pretty interesting program. Uh, one other thing I should mention is that this show, uh, we are loosely connected with uh, the Coursera's course uh, introduction to public speaking. We work, uh, we try to get many of those folks who are taking that course to join us and have a place where they can uh, give their speeches or share their speeches and have this discussion that they can't really on that course. That course is pretty much uh, one directional. You either record your speech, then you get your feedback. So here what we try to do is uh, we take it to the next level where we get to learn about public speaking. We get to teach. Uh, once you do this once, once you finish the course, that you're in a position to teach others. Uh, and that's one of the ways to learn too. And then the third thing, of course, is uh, you should be recording speeches. And as you're recording, you want to share them. And this is a place where it's a good place to get a, a feedback from us. And again, <clears throat> we're just going to give you our feedback based on the feedback you're looking for. The ultimate feedback is when you do it in front of an audience. So we just want to make it clear that we're not the authority on that this is the way you should do it. And lastly, the purpose of this uh, cohort and this so uh, is to support each other. Because public speaking is fearful. Every time you speak, uh, you're taking a risk. It's high stakes. And uh, this is the place where you get to test it out and you get the support you need so that when you do it in the real world, you will be able to do well. OK? So that's the program. I just take given you a long introduction. And uh, once Julie gives her introduction, we'll move to our three-minute speeches. Julie? Thank you, Jay. Um... So my name is Julie Wu Finkelstein. Um, 
I am also a member of a class, a student and mentor for the public speaking class. And I run um, an event that is uh, a more entry level than this. It's a reading and discussion program because I find out some students uh, really need to warm up before they speak. So the reading helps the students to have a topic that they can discuss and then to discuss spontaneously on that topic. It's a, again, as Jay says, a learning, mutually supportive, and practicing community, and that's on Saturday mornings. Um, if you need more information, my email address is julie, J U L I E C L W 999 at gmail.com. Again, J U L I E C L W 999 at gmail.com. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> yeah, thanks a lot, Julie. And uh, when I uh, I will include your email uh, when when this is uh, recorded, so that people can uh, uh, contact you if they want to if they have any questions or uh, information that they want from you uh, regarding that other course that you also conduct. Okay, so at this point uh, we basically move into our three minute uh, segment, and I'll go first. <clears throat> so I want to talk about uh, something that is a little bit heavy. And this has to do with politics. Not really heavy into politics, like you know, I'm not going to try to convince you who to vote for or anything. This dates back to Barack Obama, actually. If you ask anybody, what is the most famous speech that Barack Obama ever gave? And most of them will cite the speech he gave at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. That's where people got to see Barack Obama as a real positioned him as a real rock star, uh, not only the Democratic Party, but uh, as one of the top leaders in this country, based on that speech he gave, where, you know, he's took that line where he said, you know, there's no red state, blue state, there's only United States of America. I mean, it was a very well, if you look at that speech, at some point, we may actually review that speech, because it is worth reviewing. Uh, he does a terrific job in that speech. Uh, he introduces himself to the nation. It uh, eventually he became a senator, then he became president, reelected, and now he's going to retire in about uh, one year or longer from now. But uh, the question that I always ask is that that was not the most important speech he ever gave. The most important speech he ever gave was in 2002, that very few people at that time even uh, heard it. And this was a speech he gave, it was an anti war rally in Chicago where he came out against the Iraq war. At that time, there was a lot of debate going on regarding the Iraq war. Should America, Congress give the force authorization to Congress to go to war uh, in Iraq? And uh, so, the, so the question you may ask, so for him, it was a political thing. It was a risk he took. In politics is risk, just like public speaking is risk. He took a risk and he took a position at that time, even though at that time the country was in favor of the war, he decided that he wanted he had to be opposed to it. Now it could have been political. It could that's what he believed, and part of the reason was he was going to run for Senate in two thousand and four. So he wanted to go on record opposing that war because that's where the votes were being taken in the Congress, and he was running for Senate. So they can't say, oh, it was easy since you were not in the Senate. So he wanted to go on the record before the votes were taken. So he came out against it. Move fast forward to 2007, 2008, when he was running for president, it was that speech is what got him to win in Iowa. Because if you remember, there weren't that many major differences between his position and Hillary Clinton's position. They pretty much, they, around the edges, there were some differences around education, health care. But the major difference was that Hillary Clinton, when she was in the Senate, she was a senator from New York at that time, she voted for that force authorization. And Barack Obama kept on hitting on her that that was lack of judgment, because by that time, the war was not going well. So his position was the right position at that time, in 2007. So why Iowa? why this was so important in Iowa. If Obama does not win Iowa, he doesn't win. It's, it would have been over. Uh, because if you go back and look at it, 
majority of the African Americans at that time were pretty much in Hillary Clinton's camp. They really didn't think that Barack Obama was going to win it. He was impressive and all that, but they didn't think that he was he was going to eventually beat the president because it hasn't been done before. In the past, you had people like Jesse Jackson, uh, Al Sharpton, and some others, Shirley Chisholm, run, but they never really did anything. Uh, Jesse Jackson did win a few primaries, but never was really that uh, uh, credible as a candidate. Uh, but once they saw Obama win Iowa, they immediately realized that, hey, here's somebody we need to give a closer look to. And that he ended up winning South Carolina after that. After New Hampshire, he lost, but he won South Carolina, and then he was on, uh, he was hard to beat after that. And the reason why Iowa was so important is because Iowa doesn't have that many African Americans. Obama had to convince the the white liberals to to vote for him. And the issue that was the dif difference maker was that uh, their Iraq uh, position. And since Obama went on the record at that speech in 2002, it helped him beat Hillary Clinton in Iowa and pretty much uh, got him to win the nomination and eventually became the president and perhaps has changed the history uh, in this country and perhaps the world. So again, the point of this uh, three minute talk is that, that sometimes there are important speeches and sometimes there are really famous speeches. And according to me, if you, by any definition, the most important speech that Barack Obama get, gave that helped his career was that 2002 speech when he was a state senator from uh, Illinois. Okay, uh, Julie. Thanks, Jay. Um, uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about success and what success means to me and what it could mean. And then asking you the question, uh, Jay and uh, anybody who's listening, what does success mean to you? And then, um, yeah, what does success mean to you? So I remember um, about 25 years ago when my son was about three, I had this conversation with um, a, a doctor, therapist uh, in a workshop. And, and I, I felt like I was not successful as a mother. And um, my son was three years old and um, his well-being was very important to me and I didn't feel like I was contributing to success. Uh, and so success to me was not about being famous or making money, but to do, to do well, to excel as something that's important to me. And um, most people, some of us turn, gets turned off at the word of success. But um, I like to ask, what is important to you? What is important to you right now? Um, and how are you, how do you think you're doing? How well are you think you're doing? Because to me, um, success leads to skillful means, which means it's an ongoing uh, observation and investigation on how well you're doing and then how much energy you put in. Is that in alignment with what's important to you? And that was a very interesting question because I came from an IT corporate environment. I worked at a Fortune, uh, Fortune 50 company. And uh, so success at that time was about, you know, doing well at work, getting the money I paid, being respected by my colleagues. But in the midst of that transition, uh, success became a personal goal and a personal barometer. And 30 years later, I'm still asking that question. Uh, what is successful? What does being successful mean? And um, how much time do I dedicate to what is important to make it so that I can do well in it? And amazingly, the, the answer to that for me today is a couple of them, one, a few of them. One is that usually if we align our success goals to what is important to us, that leads to happiness. And fundamentally, I think there is a human drive that we want to be happy. And I will go further to say we want other people to be happy. And for me, the priority switch was uh, 
that corporate success or uh, uh, business skill success, where I was spending 90% of my time, even though I was retired, was really not my top priority. And I having a good relationship with my son and my husband and my sisters uh, became top priority. So success to me means two things. Is that one, you need to align your efforts to that which is what's important to you. And two, uh, what's important to you uh, includes for you to, uh, to improve what's important to you or to be more connected should include in your life some kind of practice, some kind of skillful means. So I turn that back question back to you. What does success mean to you and what can you do about it? Thank you. Oh, that was excellent. Yes, I guess I'll have to answer this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting, um, interesting uh, 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 speech that you just gave. Um, yeah, I, I think I think of this all the time. Uh, you know, what is success? How do you define success? And I think it's a question that uh, we all need to ask. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're just basically kind of uh, going around with, without really much, uh, you know, vision or blindly just following things without really giving much thought to it. And I decided that success to me means uh, not necessarily money because uh, money is, we don't live with money, right? Money is uh, just can change. You can have money one day and if the stock market crashes, it could be gone. So money can disappear pretty quickly. And even if you're investing or anything, uh, you, you need to be, Success is how you ap approach things in life, essentially. And in my case, uh, I like to add value through learning. And that's part of this program, that I'm hoping I'm adding some value to myself and to others. And I think the only thing that I, I've come to realize is that you've got to realize what you control and what you don't control. And what I do control is that I can learn new things. And by learning new things, I feel I can add value to others, uh, whether it comes to business, uh, as far as my consulting is concerned, whether it comes to public speaking, having conversations. Even when you meet somebody, uh, there was a very interesting quote that, uh, and actually I complimented this. She's a professor at Stanford. Her name is uh, Professor Tina Selig. And she teaches this course on entrepreneurship. And she said when, before the course starts, she has this one phrase that she uses only in the beginning. And the phrase, I really love this phrase. She said, never miss an opportunity to be fabulous. And she said, the reason she uses that is because in school, you think that if you get an A, then that's enough. And she says, I don't want them to be limited by grade point. Grade point is something we have to give them as part of their taking a course. But being fabulous is something you define. So, I do this course and I put this at top of my head, like I want to be fabulous doing this show because it may, it not only will add value to me, but it'll add value to others. If there's something you can say, wow, I never thought about that. That was something valuable. Then that's the motto that I want to live by. You know, don't never miss an opportunity to be fabulous. And that means that, you know, you have to, that requires work. You can't just be fabulous by being lazy. So, there's a lot of work involved, but at least you have uh, that vision, some goal, like every conversation, try to be fabulous. All right, so I'm seeing double, I'm seeing two uh, pictures there. Okay, I don't know why that's the case. Okay, so at this point, we've, I'm going to take a quick break. Do, do you have any comments, Julie, or we can move on to segment our first segment? You're uh, you're muted. There was a you were frozen for a minute on Hangout, and then it popped back with two of me. So um, I'm not sure what I can do. Maybe I'll just. No, it's okay. It's it's okay. I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out. But right now I can hear you. So that's fine. Okay. Fine. Okay. So we'll move to segment one then. Okay. Yes. Okay. You may want to uh, mute. Mute. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. We'll take a quick break. Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 20, segment number one. In this segment, I uh, want to have a discussion around speech. 
And it's speech as it is today, a modern speech or evolution of speech. So we need to go back a little bit back, far back, <laughs> the time when Aristotle, I believe, wrote this in his uh, essay called Rhetoric. And uh, he, he defined what a speech a speech is compo attributes of a speech, which is uh, uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. Right? Ethos, put it briefly, is like what's your, your credibility. You have to have credibility if you're going to give a speech. Like, why would somebody want to listen to you? So that's the ethos. Uh, to keep it short, then there is the pathos. Pathos is the emotion that you bring into a particular speech uh, to convey a message. And then logos is obviously logic. If the speech doesn't have a logic, then you made a lot of noise or you entertained, but you didn't convey anything that was worth remembering or sharing. So these three attributes have traditionally been the main thing that people have passed on. And even today, they'll just tell you, oh, your speech has got to have ethos, pathos, and logos. But <clears throat> I think there are other two attributes that I think we also need to look at. And one of them is, I, for no better word, I don't know a, a Greek word for this, so I'll call it, I'll use an English word, presence. Presence is very important today. Partly this, I would say this started in 1960, pretty much with the uh, Kennedy-Nixon debate. Prior to that, presence was never deemed that important, but television changed it. With television, you just cannot, after that Kennedy-Nixon debate, you just cannot get in front of a television without having that presence. Presence became very important. And I think uh, there was a, a psychologist, or uh, I don't know what his title was, Marshall McLuhan, where he said, medium is the message. That's when that, it, that got coined, that medium is the message. And what that meant was that after Kennedy-Nixon debate, person was going to be measured on their, uh, their ability to exude that, uh, that executive or that leadership presence. It just wasn't enough to have ethos, pathos, and logos. You still needed those, but presence became important. To just give you a case in point, uh, in that debate, the people that watched that debate on TV, they picked uh, Kennedy that he won. People that listened to it on the radio thought that Nixon won. Unfortunately, there were 120, this was in 1960, there were 120 million people who watched it on television. So it completely swung that election perception. Uh, prior to that election, Nixon was perceived that he was winning. After the debate, that swung. Suddenly, everybody felt that Kennedy, perception was that Kennedy was the one who was winning and Nixon was the one who was trailing. So that one debate changed the whole dynamics of that 1960 election. And since then, even you look at Clinton, Bush, all of that, that even we are having debates in this United States right now, where how you appear on TV makes a tremendous amount of difference. You just cannot just win today with just ethos, pathos, and logos. That's just not enough. You need that presence. That presence is very important in uh, conveying your message. People are just not going to pay attention if you don't exude that presence. So that's the fourth attribute I would add to it that is important today. And it started with 1960, if I have to trace back to history. The other one is, I call it, uh, and again, no better name, I call it micro-targeting. -target, targeting. And again, this comes from politics again. In politics today, they micro-target. Micro-targeting is very important. That's how people advertise. If they know me as being an Asian, Indian, college, educated, etc., that's my micro-target. That message, if that appeals to me, that's going to resonate. I'm going to pay attention to that. And that is something you can't ignore in a speech today. And I think this was ushered in with the social media. Social media is micro-target because everybody is uh, is unique out there. Now, obviously, you can't treat everybody that uniquely when you're giving a speech. But prior to giving a speech, you need to know how to micro-target your audience. And then you need to prepare your speech so that you have a reasonable coverage of the, mic 
of all the audience members if you can micro target them for example uh, uh, like let's say if I go to Silicon Valley and I was giving speech where there are a lot of uh, Asian Indians who are in the audience now if I was giving a speech I may to see if there is something because the way I look at it, the content is fixed the content is not going to change right because content you can get it from books but when you're giving a speech that makes a big difference on how much they're going to pay attention to your content so you if you can micro target it makes your speech that much much more people will pay attention to it and will be likely to share it so getting back to my example if I can cite some example that they will resonate with them so just for example, if I come up with a quote from Gandhi or something like that, the people that are there, Asian Indians, they immediately, the ears will perk up like, wow, this guy is talking about Gandhi. This is somebody that's so important to us, right? And that's a micro-targeting. And this type of subtle micro-targeting is very important today when you're giving a speech. You just can't go and say, hey, I'm just going to focus on ethos, pathos, and logos. You need to really focus also on the presence part of it. And you also need to micro target your audience if you want to really uh, otherwise all you're doing is you're giving a speech and you're randomly like you know throwing your speech at the proverbial wall and hoping it sticks and i think you got to be prepared that it sticks and that means there's got to be some work that you got to do when you're giving a speech that you want to achieve your objective and i just these are my thoughts it's not that well developed yet but uh, i think i'm just taking these ideas not from public speaking, I'm taking them from politics, and politics is where speaking is very important. So, uh, Julie, do you have any thoughts on, uh, on you know, you can go through the ethos, pathos, and logos, and then there are two other attributes that I've just added to that, presence and micro-targeting, uh, and that's based on television age, and the other one is based on the social media age. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, Jay, it, this is very interesting, because when I first looked at the the ethos, pathos, and the logos, um, I thought, no, everything will be connected to that. And then um, I, I find the idea of presence very interesting. You know, it's kind of like a nonverbal uh, gestalt of the person. And um, I think that, you know, I, I might use the word charisma. Uh, and I think that is very, very... Um, relevant to today's uh, mark uh, today's uh, communication because everything is happening so fast and um, you know the, the widespread technology of YouTube and so you know according to Malcolm Gladwell um, in the book blink uh, the perception of this into anybody is made with, within the first half a second or something like that. So way even before you open up your mouth. Um, so presence is very, very important. So I appreciate that you opened that up for me. And the second uh, thing about micro-targeting, now that is very interesting because uh, there's a paradox to it, right? Um, at the same time that uh, we are opening up to the world through technology, uh, that there is a proliferation of um, marketing and including any kind of outreach that's becoming, as you call it, micro-targeting. It's profiling groups into smaller and smaller clusters. So when I go on Amazon and it says, these are the books you might like, that's a kind of micro-targeting. So what I get from what you're saying is even when you speak, um, you want to understand the characteristic of the group you're talking to and then work with that and I I have to think that's interesting although I don't really have any other response other than that it merits investigation um, so I will take uh, two more points to add to that the, the, the first one is like presence, but I'll call it connectivity, that um, when, when, when I speak, the first thing that's important to me is when, not whether I'm a leadership or not, but I want to feel that I have a relationship with the audience. So to me, that's connectivity. And that comes out of um, 
some parameters of empathy, understanding my audience, so that might be related to your uh, micro-targeting, uh, but not identical, and also feeling of, um, well, wishing, wishing to get to know the person and wanting the person to get to know me. And the second one is the impact of uh, mass media on our presence and presentations in general. So I, um, I got an article from this woman who is developing a business on how to improve the quality of um, employees during the recruitment process. Because we all know that there's a huge overhead when you hire, even when you hire the right person, there's a huge overhead. You don't really break even on the person until the first or second year. But when there's a mistake, that could cost you millions of dollars. And so she has this process and she wrote some interesting articles. And so she reaches a certain press audience, right? My question to her was, uh, are you going to do a YouTube? And so technology changes um, how many people we can reach and the speed through which we can reach them. So to, for me to read an article takes about five, ten minutes. For me to see her YouTube, um, I get what she wants to say in the first 30 seconds. So I think the stakes are higher and the time to deliver the message is compressed. So I would say efficiency maybe or effectiveness is some of the, the two new, quite, uh, I would just call it E and E, effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, another criteria you might want, us modern speakers might want to look at. And so, yes, uh, logos, pathos, uh, ethos, pathos, logos, presence or charisma, micro-targeting or knowing your audience, connecting with your audience, and effectively, effectively and efficiently delivering the messages. I turn that back over to you. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's an interesting one. I would say that effectiveness um, is an interesting one, and I think one of the uh, that is something new because if you look at the traditional attributes, and this has stood the test of time, right? for almost uh, 2,000 years, and you still need that. Ethos, pathos, and logos are still, uh, those are the grand, the big three, the big three of speech. you got to have those three, right? And uh, in, the, in old days, they really didn't speak, they didn't give short speeches. Speech was like entertainment, information, and uh, many other things, right? Speech was it. Uh, people went to listen to speeches uh, for entertainment also and logic and there was a lot involved in speeches. People spent a lot of time uh, developing the speeches. The one thing they did not do much uh, in the old days, uh, if you look at it, was uh, a, a short speech. The one that pretty much uh, set the standard was Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address, uh, which to this day, probably was the greatest speech given with the fewest number of words ever used. Uh, and he only used like 272 words. Even if you say it, uh, uh, say that slowly, uh, all of the speech slowly, it'll take you probably less than three minutes. Uh, but the one thing they didn't do much is sound bites. Today, sound bites are very important in a speech because you've got to get that, because that's the only part that people will remember. And remember, we have changed, right? Because of technology. And you mentioned about mass media and the technology. Most of the time, even movies, the film scenes change very quickly. Some Someone told me that they change every six seconds, which is just amazing. And that's how we are able to, we're processing information uh, because of television. And our brain is kind of being wired that way, where things have to constantly change. We can't just stare at one person. What we're doing is kind of rare, actually, talking for more than an hour like this, uh, which a lot of people are just not able to do. And you have to adjust your speech to adapt to the modern way that people process information. And the other thing uh, 
and I don't know whether you mentioned this or not, you are just a click away from being zoned out. People today have their smartphones with them. And if you are not attuned to that, then your speech is going to fail very quickly. People today, if they, if they, if you're not constantly feeding them with something different, new, just like on, when you see a film, things, scenes are changing. Your speech, in a way, in in a way, has to be a little bit choppy. And the person who seems to have kind of figured this out, based on everything that I've seen so far, is Donald Trump. If you ever see Donald Trump speaking, he doesn't give a speech ever. He's all over the map. He'll say something about this, then he'll do this, then he'll do this, then he'll do this. But somehow the audience likes that. They're not, they're not saying, hey, let me hear you give this big talk about the economy. He doesn't do any of that. He just talks about so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, my ratings are high, I'm rich, you know, I have a beautiful wife, this, this, this. It's like he's constantly giving them so much information that that's, he's giving the speech the way people's mind is processing it. Out of all the candidates that I see, the only one who has figured that out, and that's because he's had a lot of experience as a, as a, a, being on television, that that's how people process information. And I know that's kind of difficult to do it, but look, you know, he's figured something out that if that's how people are processing information, perhaps that's the way you should organize your speech, not to the extent that he does it, but evidently, it seems to be working for him. So, uh, any any comments on that, Julie? As far as how people are processing uh, speech today? I wasn't going to respond, but this um, uh, response came. So, it, it sounds like uh, Donald Trump is feeding into uh, what Zen people call the monkey mind. You know, and the problem with um, living in the world of monkey mind is you get fed whatever people give you. <laughs> so I would suggest that as a human being <laughs> that we evolve to a more deliberate and awareness thinking. <laughs> and so perhaps meditation is uh, valuable to even in this age or especially in this age. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think Donald Trump would do well on this show. So I'll invite him, but I don't think he can last for an hour and a half talking about one topic because he needs to constantly change topics. And that's the thing that I think will eventually come back and hurt him when people want him to go deep into a particular issue. He's not going to be able to do it because uh, the, the logic, the, the part that he's kind of missing is the logos part. He's got the other part. All, and it's another thing that a successful speech <clears throat> has to have all these components. You can't just say, well, you know, I'll leave out the presence part of it and hopefully the ethos, pathos, and logos will carry the day. I'm not sure today that is going to do it, the modern speech, okay? <clears throat> if you're going on television or if you're, if you're on, because once you're on television today, you're also on social media too. So they kind of go together because today with social media, it's just not the charisma like you mentioned, presence and charisma. There is also these other parts of like effectiveness, connectivity, the mass media. So I, I think to close this out, I think you would agree that to give a good speech today, it's gotten a lot more difficult than the time when Aristotle came up with his uh, uh, ethos, uh, pathos, and logos. Any closing thoughts? Okay, so at this point, uh, we're going to take a quick break and move to our uh, second slide. Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, uh, segment number two, episode number 20, segment number two. My name is Jay Oza, and in this segment, uh, we're going to review a, I call it a big speech. And this is uh, probably one of Ronald Reagan's uh, best speeches he's ever given, one of the best speeches he's ever given. He's given quite a few, but I would say this would rank among the top five for sure. And this is the speech he gave at the, uh, uh, in 1984 to commemorate the, uh, the D-Day invasion on June 6th, uh, 1944. And he gave this speech in 1984, 40th anniversary. And you know, you know, Reagan is known as a great communicator. And 
you know, this is not about politics. You can like him or dislike him. The fact is that he was indeed a great communicator. And what made Reagan a great communicator was uh, not only the way he spoke and he connected really well with the audience, but he talked about big things. You know, people used to always laugh him off as like, oh, he's a joke, he's this and that. I think over time, when you go back and look at his speeches, uh, that was the narrative that, you know, he was an actor, he starred with a monkey and stuff like that. And yeah, at that time, that was the narrative. And during the time when he was there, you tend to get partisan and you don't realize that there is a real talent behind what this man was saying. Uh, but when you go back and you look at some of the speeches, he said a lot of big things. And this is one of them. And what he does that's very interesting about the speech is his main message here is how to connect the past to the present. That's the main purpose of the speech. And the past here is this brutal battle that took place at Point de Hoc, where these rangers, 225, pretty much risked their lives for to save the continent, right, as he says in his speech. And out of 225, only 90 actually survived, where they had to knock out this gun that posed a threat to the 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 naval uh, the Allied ships, and it fell to these uh, uh, 225 Rangers to climb up the cliff to destroy that gun, uh, the guns that were uh, uh, positioned at the top. And if you notice the speech in the beginning, he talks about all the different uh, uh, allies that were involved. Where he brings up uh, Scotland, uh, the French resistance, the Polish cavalry, the Canadians, the British, etc. Okay, so so there he's acknowledging the, the heroism of these uh, rangers and other people who are also part of it, as he as he says in there, uh, that uh, this was just not an American effort. It was essentially an effort by many, many different people coming together with a common purpose. And that was his whole theme, that there was a common purpose that if you ask these rangers, they would say, listen, we were just part of it. There was a much larger coalition that was uh, aligned to make that happen. And and that is a very important point he's making because as you go further down the speech, his main target is that how the allies came together to destroy Nazi Germany, the, the Axis power. That at that time, 1984, that that same level of alliance is needed to defeat the Soviet power. And that is his main objective of the speech. And he's using the past to show that, hey, perhaps we may have gotten a little bit too lackadaisical or too comfortable, but the work is still not done. Like how we brought the past uh, enemies are working together, like Germany. Germany became an ally, right? Germany, Italy, all they became an ally, even though they were uh, 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 fighting, we were fighting, US, so the allies were fighting against them that we're also ready to bring the Soviet Union to become an ally too, along with all the other countries uh, in the Eastern Bloc at that time. I mean, the, the speech is really historical speech, and if you analyze it, there's so much in the speech that he's, uh, he's giving here. It, that's why I call it, this is a big speech. To conclude here, at the end of it, what he, his logic here is what really is so amazing, that we worked, together and defeated uh, Nazi Germany. We need that same level of effort to free the Europe, uh, the Eastern Europe, who is still not free from the Soviet empire. And as it turned out, uh, five years later, that is indeed what happened. So in my opinion, this is a big speech. And the reason it is big is because he's saying something that is very complicated and he explains it in a very simple manner and he's using this example of point to hawk as a way to show the Europe at that time. Remember, this speech was given in 1984. Today, we take it for granted that that same level of effort, that, that same level of uh, 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 not interest, but uh, resolve is going to uh, liberate the rest, of the, the, your, the rest of the continent. And that's indeed what happened. So I, I consider this is a, a, a speech that most of us 
are never going to be giving. <laughs> We're not going to be president. We're going to look at the past battle. But it's a kind of speech where you could give it a company, where something passed, where you accomplished something amazing, and you want to use the past to show them that we can still accomplish that if we come together and work together to meet the future challenges. So even though this speech is big in a sense as far as the uh, countries coming together, the same thing can happen in a company or any kind of organization where past success could be used as a way to show the people that, hey, we've gotten a little bit, uh, we lost our uh, game a little bit, or we we're not keeping an eye on the ball. We can still uh, use the past to accomplish great things in the future. Uh, Julie, do uh, you have any comments on this? Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah. Um since I'm still working on my uh, persuasive speech, I'm looking at uh, how to um, look at emotions. I thought that I would look at both of those speeches in terms of emotional value. Now, clearly, um, this speech has uh, extremely high emotional value. And so, um, I'd like to talk about a little bit about how he uh, created that emotional value. Uh, first of all, he packed uh, so much information. This is one of the most dense speeches, so it's amazing that in the 13 minutes he was able to pack the whole history of um, the event and then um, it felt like a little bit like propaganda to me at the end, which is effective. I mean, um, so he he knows what makes an Americans take, right? He he uses the words like um, faith and belief, loyalty and love, and he said um, that uh, he uses religion. Uh, Do not bow your heads. See God's will for you. And then he says that he quote the Bible and say, "I will not forsake thee nor fail thee." So. Um, he also uses repetition, and when he told a story, he evoked multi-sensory. He talked about what the men were doing, what the ass felt like, right? So all those things kind of bring us into um, his space, into his sphere. And uh, he uses words like profound moral difference, the use of force for liberation and not for conquest. So these are like I think he's digging pretty, digging pretty deep into our psyche, and then he talked about the value of uh, democracy is uh, liberty fights tyranny. At the end, he's really uh, making a political platform, um, but he um, he still talk about let us make a vow, right? Let us. So he brought us into his space, and then he connected with us. And then we became this one giant body. I think there's a there's a psychology where like group think. I think Reagan was master at group think, but he was also group feel and group act. You know, uh, because he's not just saying let think this way with me. He's saying let us be ready to see that beach house. Let us um, we are all with you now. Let us make a vow. You know. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Let us continue to stand for the ideals. So it was a very emotional, inspirational speech. And he used uh, all the senses. He used a uh, deep words uh, and with just the right tone, right? He was not too excited, but familial, you know, so there was a great connectivity. So I believe, um, I believe he, uh, those are some of the things he did. And repetition, so it's almost like grooving our brains into that atmosphere. So it's, I think those are some of the skills he used to create a strong emotional uh, appeal and connection. So at the end, we're going to do whatever he says because we feel so inspired and in alignment with his values and his vision. <clears throat> yeah. I. I I think some of the uh, 
the the end i mean reagan definitely had a message here right his message was that uh, that all these people and he had these people sitting right there uh, he called them the boys or men of winter hawk and they made tremendous sacrifice for what is basically to liberate this continent and then after they liberated uh, they uh, essentially didn't want to conquer these people there was a real logic in this uh, in this uh, speech if you go through it uh, line by line that after they won they basically uh, uh, helped germany get back and italy and other countries get back on its uh, on its feet and they are part of now they're part of the ally right they're not like hey you are we we fought you you did this you did this they accepted them because they changed right because germany basically surrendered and they just said okay we 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 lost we're going to be disarming etc cetera, etc cetera. so that is what happened right and what reagan is saying is that listen we made a lot of sacrifices these people here made a lot of sacrifices and he's rep- he's the president of the united states and he has to represent uh, the the biggest country that promotes freedom liberty and democracy and here we have soviet union who basically did the same thing but they stayed in these countries and that's just unacceptable logically it's just unacceptable and that's the logic he's giving here and you know we don't want to go to war you know he keeps saying that over and over again you know we're looking for peace but uh, you know give us some indication that that's that's what you want to do too because uh, if you're not going to do that then we're going to be constantly at each other and you know we're not willing to accept the way because that was not the agreement these are all countries that were once uh, controlled or ruled by the nazi invaded by the nazi germany and we liberated them and we told the people listen you can have your own democracy and do what you want but uh, and become part of the ally as long as you pose no threat and he's giving this as a challenge to soviet union you know that you need to do that too and but he's telling the the other countries that the only way that's going to happen is if we're united that's the message here that we got to be united otherwise the soviet union will see no need to change their way and he used the word changing i think couple of times at the end so Uh, do do I think this is a propaganda? I don't think it's a propaganda. I think it's a pretty much an honest speech. He's just telling it the way it exists. He's not telling anything that's not existing out there. And he has a message that look, if you believe in democracy, you can't just say that democracy is only good for us. If we did this in the past, then we can still do that in the future. And history has proven them out that he was correct on this as, you know, Soviet uh, empire no longer exists. and whether reagan had a, a lot to do with it i think he had uh, he at least kept that focus that uh, accepting soviet empire was just not acceptable and i think uh, this speech uh, basically reinforces that a- any any closing thoughts julie yeah oh i'm oh i'm still on still yeah i just want to say that when i used the word propaganda i didn't mean it as a pejorative term but merely as a as a message to to sway the masses and clearly his intention was to talk to and he knows he knows that this is a message to not just going to America but to the world audience so he clearly using this opportunity to deliver a message and to sway people to his point of view and i thought he did that very pers- persuasively that's what i meant yeah no that's true and you got to remember if you you have to because when you take a historical speech it's kind of difficult to review them because we review them based on the present day and if you go back and look at it in 1984 there were a lot of peace protests going on in europe where they felt there was some issue around some weapons uh, and reagan wanted to deploy these uh, missiles in europe and a lot of the europe countries people were protesting they didn't want that to happen so this was if you look at the context of this in this the speech was given that was the context saying that hey you know there are still the work is not over yet you know <laughs> yeah i want peace too it was almost like telling to these protesters hey i'm all for peace look but i'm giving you the reason why my view is so different from your view let me explain it to you so he's basically talking to all those uh, protesters at that time who didn't want uh, the cruise missiles and some of the other weapons uh, deployed in Europe as a counterbalance to the Soviet threat so i think that's the part that uh, 
that that he's trying to he's having a he's giving he's laying out an argument that uh, that this battle is still not over with the Soviet Union. There's still more work to be done. Yeah, so I agree that he definitely had a had a position that he wanted to uh, get across here. Okay, I think uh, we I'll take a brief break and we'll move to our seg uh, last segment. Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 20, segment number three. In this segment, we're going to take a look at a speech that was given by Stephen Levitt. He's of the Freakonomics fame. And this was a TED Talk. And he's talking about research that uh, that was done by one of his colleagues. Uh, his name was Sudhir Venkatesh. I think when he was at uh, University of, uh, when they were both at University of Chicago. And they did research. Uh, on those gangs, gangs in the Chicago area. And it's a very interesting speech because if you look at the speech, the, the, the speech is basically, you kind of just, it, it's, it's something that I want to discuss here because the topic is so engrossing. Like you want to know about this gang, like what happened here? How did they find out all this information? And like in one sense, it's, there's, a, there's a threat of scariness. Like how did that even happen? How do you even get in to infiltrate the gang? And then you kind of feel sorry for this gang. Like, oh my God, the life here is terrible. Like, this is just no way to live, that they just don't have an out here. So he kind of shows what the life is like uh, being a gang member and that how these people at the low level are so exploited. So there's like one aspect of it, that whole process, like how do they find this information? And he's describing all this. The way he's describing it is, is very riveting. And then he gives you that that gang members to understand the gang. Think of it as like a corporation, like McDonald's. That that's no different than working at McDonald's and how work McDonald's is structured. Just that here they're not selling burgers; they're selling drugs. But the the, the overall structure is not that different. The big difference is that at McDonald's you don't get killed, and selling drugs is a very dangerous uh, uh, you know endeavor where your chances of getting killed are even higher than even if you murder somebody and uh, are on death row, as he points out, it is one of the stats. So the speech is really, really well put together where he's giving so much. And he kind of tells us in the beginning that this is how his speech is, is going to be, where he's going to talk about uh, uh, the, the gangs, how they found out about it, what are some of the findings of it. And then at the end, he even connects it that at the end, think of these gangs in a way, it's like a business. And what can you learn from them? Are they any different from some of these economists who learn, who study corporations? In their case, they're studying gangs. But at the end, they, they're they not that dissimilar <laughs> in how they understand the economy. Maybe they don't use the same type of uh, vocabulary that the people in, in, in the, the, the Ivy Towers use in the economics department. But at the end, if you translate it, it's not that different. It's the same thing. And sometimes he said that the people in the gangs may have it all figured out even better than some of the economists, since the economists can't seem to argue why the CEO pay seems to be going up all the time, where the gang members have it figured out that, you know, that, that there is a reason why the CEO pay has to go up, because they don't want to look weak and, uh, you know, uh, to, to people uh, below them. So I thought this was a, a really a, a well-delivered speech. Uh, it wasn't one of those uh, real barn burner type of speech. He's just, this is what you would want a professor, and this these are academics. I think he's a professor at University of Chicago, where he has a very good content, and he presents it in a very interesting manner. And I thought even, even his delivery was very good. The way he keeps it, uh, keeps you on your, you, you know, on your toes, like what is more going to come out? I want to know more about it. There's so much here that they've they've found here, and uh, I, I think it, it, he makes this material really come alive the way he presents it. Julie, do you have any comments on the on the speech? Uh, thanks, Jay. Yeah, so I agree with you. This was a very interesting speech, and thank you for picking this one because I have 
been interested in looking at the free free economics, and I haven't done that yet. So this is was an opportunity. So I I want to focus on emotions because um, that's my area of interest right now in um, evolve in the evolution of my speech here. So first of all, it's obviously not the same emotional tone as um, Reagan's speech, President Reagan's speech, but yet we know it is in fact effective. So what were some of the tools that he used to make it effective? I would say that he used humor. And actually the first example of humor didn't work well, but he just uh, went right through it like a true champion, right? He says, uh, uh, to keep the tone light and optimistic, I'm going to talk about the suffering of others. So, um, and that, that joke did not go well. So he tried to use humor there, but it doesn't work. So for many of us, that will happen. Um, but the next, the next humor, he was very funny, right? Because he says, this is an R-rated show, and there will be foul language. But to assure you, there will be no nudity. <laughs> Even as I'm saying it, it's funny, because the joke was on him. And I think that was very important for connectivity, right? Because we always, uh, I was trying to say, is we want to connect to the audience. And I think there was a pivotal change there where the audience really connected with him. Um, in a certain sense, it, it's not emotive, but it was an emotional speech because he was working uh, on a, a topic that I think, um, he, in essence, he was kind of preaching to the to his choir, right? This is not Reagan's choir. And his choir were, like you said, liberals who are academics. And so if he had used all those emotional words, this group may be, um, may be turned off. But what he did do was he used statistics. And he used data, right? He made a parallel of um, the, uh, McDonald's with the um, with the with the gang, and he noted that their top levels are called the board of directors and regional VPs. So he he brought the strange into our world, so that they're no longer strange. So um, so I think the pivot here is uh, the gang. He says that he he wanted. He wants to show us that being a gang is not a glamorous life. But I think he also did something, is he pivoted our, our perception of gang being something out strange and scary into something that they're just like us. They want to make a living. They live under the structures of unfettered capitalism, but it's still capitalism, and that they, they care about survival and that they have, uh, they have innate intelligence, right? Because when he went into um, the, the three um, economic theories, he showed that how it's worked out. Like the gaming theory is that people don't shoot in the air because they understand the whole game. That the, um, it's uh, ecological, right? When you do something, there's uh, repercussions. Um, he used, I think one of the things that he did in using, uh, in creating this emotion is that we have a fundamental deep psychic value of not, not getting killed. So when he showed us the death rate, that uh, in four years, uh, a gang member has a 25% chance of getting killed, and that the death rate of young black male in America is twice as high as soldiers in the Mideast. I think that those are, those are data and they're cool, but they also engender emotion and connection with not just him, but the subject of his discussion. So I think he did that very well through humor, through using relevant data, and then through giving us insights such as the gaming theory, uh, the compensa compensating differentials, and that uh, um, gang members 
want to make again leaders make a big money or continue to take money when the lowest down is not because um, they're greedy, but that they want to not appear weak. And you know, as a Chinese, uh, the the concept, experience, cultural value of not losing face is paramount. So perhaps that's not just Chinese, but underlying characteristic. I think he did an excellent job using data and humor to connect us with the topic and open us up to some new insights. <clears throat> no, that's a very good insight there. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think the thing that I, I liked, uh, I mean, looking beyond the speech, because you, you, I always measure the speech not only as far as what the person said and how he said it. Uh, the other part is that does the speech make you think to the point where you're saying, wow, there's a lot of understanding I'm getting from the speech that I didn't know before. It helped me understand certain things much better. And one thing it helped me understand is that gangs, and he kind of explains this, that previously it was very hard for gangs to, it was like a sort of like a uh, passage, right? People came in and they left, right? Because you got older and you just were too old now and you moved on to your life. But with the business, it kind of changed the whole equation of the gang. Remember he gave this analogy where he says that a lot of people who made money in the beginning in, uh, in Silicon Valley or, or internet startups, but then the next gen, next ones who came after that didn't make it, right? Because the ones who made it still hung around. Like you still have Larry Ellison and all these guys who made money, they're still around. So the future ones couldn't really make it. They had to do completely something different, and that's how you make it. So then they had to go into things like uh, social media and others. Now if somebody gets into social media, they're probably not going to make it because the other ones have already made it, and they're not disappearing, like Facebook and uh, uh, you know YouTube and all these other, other companies. Same thing with the selling stuff on Internet. Amazon is there. They're still around. Uh, and I thought that was a very important point he made, that... Uh, that as a result, these people at the low end has their very little chance to get to the next level, and the ones who are at the top still remain there. So it became kind of static. And when something remains static, in fact, you can learn about business too, when people remain static in a corporate, because in a way what he's saying is that this is like a, a, a corporate entity, right? Of course, it's Ill illegal, but it's still a corporate entity. It's like an entity of some sort, not corporate maybe is the right word here and a business entity, business uh, endeavor. And that if people at the top don't move, then it becomes very static. And gangs used to be kind of dynamic. You, you had one gangs, boom, then they disappeared because the new ones came in and the, the cha everything changes. The other thing that was kind of interesting here is that I take a much broader look to it and it kind of even helps you understand when you look at uh, ISIS. Because this is kind of the way ISIS functions. They're basically a gang with a lot of land to cover. They basically are nothing but a big gang. That's what they do. They just go around, uh, have people at the low end. They probably have a similar type of uh, structure that you would see in a normal country. There is a guy at the top. Uh, then you have all these foot soldiers who have to fight the battle. They have to pay them. I've read some articles that uh, the, the, the way that ISIS makes money mostly is through theft. That's how they make money. They just go and steal things from uh, other people, uh, people that they invade, and that's how that sustains them. At some point, they, they have to, similarly, what he said uh, was uh, that, you know, we, when there's a fight out there, you have to pay the members. And one of the things that ISIS is running into problems now is that uh, as countries are getting more and more aggressive is that they have to pay these soldiers a lot of money. And they're even recruiting, like, young boys to join the fight because they just can't afford to pay them. And in order to pay them, they have to rob other people because the the muscle of ISIS are these people who are willing to lay down their lives to fight uh, Syria, Iraq, and all these other other you know countries, uh, Kurds, etc. After a while, you do run out of people if you're opening up so many fronts out there. So even though this speech was about a, a gang in Chicago, but a lot of it could apply to the current situation that we're seeing out in the in, in the Middle East. And if you look at many of these countries in the Middle East, they are in a way like a gangs. They're like very tribal. They have gangs. Like Afghanistan is like a kind of, you can think of it as a gang, that they survive based on protecting their turf. And even America realized that when they went into Iraq, that in order for them to succeed, 
they had to win over these uh, these these tribes that without them they just could not succeed so this this research that they did looking at a chicago gang can apply just to to things that are much out even outside the gang into different countries that they all operate in the same way and once they have a business model then they become even more dangerous uh, any thoughts on that julie Um, yeah, that's very interesting. So I think um, what you're saying about ISIS is perhaps, uh, um, you know, the Satya guy is looking at is the, the, the sociological systems and uh, how they work. And I think the underlying um, human needs to survive um, and to thrive and to express oneself is implicit in any gang and I think uh, in the ISIS case there is a question of survival you know clearly they these children who are recruited are poor and maybe even that who they are their own existence is being challenged um, and then the people organize to to be successful in whatever they can do. So I'll link that back to my theme. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things uh, that he points out is that uh, how they were able to recruit these uh, the, these uh, members or gang members, foot soldiers. And he basically said that, uh, you know, one, of course, was they got fooled by history. They thought that, that if they join, start out, selling drugs uh, at the street that eventually they'll rise to the next level next level at some point they could become the they could control the entire area or, 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 and, and, or the gang and become filthy rich and also a lot of the marketing and trickery he said was involved too where they would show them here you want to take some money and they'll give it to them to play around with and say okay go ahead to do what go and show off and jewelry and all that and a lot of it was all fake right um, ISIS tends to do that too, and one of the ways that ISIS recruits, uh, and this was very interesting because when I was uh, listening to the speech and I was drawing some comparison, what ISIS tends to do is something even more insidious. They try to recruit a lot of these uh, men uh, from, uh, well, most of them are, are Muslims, and tell them, like, if you join ISIS, you can come and have sex with the women because uh, it's a very conservative religion where it's not easy to date and all that. But if you join ISIS, and they're saying that that according to the religion, they've so messed up these people's brain that it's even acceptable to rape women and stuff. And they've captured these women called Azidis. And they're saying, look, if you come join us, then you'll have access to all these things that you just cannot do, but you want to do. So they're kind of playing the same kind of things that uh, these gang members do with the jewelry, that ISIS is doing the same thing as a way of using marketing and trickery to recruit people to come in and fight and of course a lot of them realize that this was just a big con game and they want to get out but they can't because if they try to escape they'll be killed so in a way isis sort of when i when i was uh, go, reading the speech when i was listening to the speech that immediately came to mind like what is happening in the world today that is very comparable to what these people have found looking at this one gang and i said wow they're Techniques might be different, but they're just nothing but a big gang member, the way they're recruiting people. And even then, if you go back and <clears throat> look at like the Nazi Germany, any time when people have to do things like that, they, they did the same thing, the, the same thing. They would take ordinary people who couldn't make it. Suddenly, the next thing you know is they're running, uh, they're becoming big shot because they joined the Nazi party. So it, it, this gang type of mentality exists in all cultures. And this research, they had somebody inside this uh, Sudhir Venkatesh spending 10 years kind of shows that, that in one sense you can have a corporation that can do everything legally that's acceptable, but underneath it, the underground economy kind of works the same way, but they're just using a totally different rules. And But at the end, they're very efficient at what they do. And of course, the bad thing is that uh, you know your survival rate is going to be very low if you if you if you join that and the same thing is going to happen with isis all the people that are joining isis very few of them are going to come out of that alive any closing thoughts julie um
Yeah, I think uh, this whole idea of uh, free economics really is interesting. Um, so, um, on what you said about ISIS being a big gang, and then taking ordinary people who can't make it, and all of a sudden they become big shots, and that they have uh, access to things they want to do without being able to do it if they don't join. I think uh, those are very good psychological insights. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that uh, pretty much uh, wraps this uh, show up. Uh, Julie, do you want to discuss anything else, or are you pretty much done? I'm done. Thank you. Okay, I'll see you next week. Uh, hopefully, I don't know what's going on with these other members, but uh, uh, we'd like to get some more people joining. But if not, hey, this is the way it is. This is good. Thank All right, you. Julie, uh, okay. enjoy your weekend, and thanks for joining. Thank you. Have a great week. Enjoy okay. your weekend. Okay, bye. -bye. bye.